the shadows, bound for the gallows. A dead man walking, so love came calling. Rise up, rise up, rise up, rise up. Six feet under. Welcome. Uh, really glad that you are uh, joining us again this week online. My name is Joel, and I am the, the pastor of uh, the church. Now, I don't know what you were up to last week during the long weekend, uh, but for me, I had a great, great Sunday morning. I actually showed up at Knox Church, just a little bit outside of Erin, Ontario, about an hour away from where our church is in Paris. This church, Knox, has been a partner for us, a satellite church with us for the last number of years. They started to, to join us during COVID and watch online. Well, when COVID ended and they were able to meet in person, they were without a minister. And so they meet in their congregation in this sanctuary right here. They have a time where music before, then they live stream our service, then they talk about the message, then they pray for their community, and they end with a, a familiar hymn and closing uh, song. I got to hang out with them. I got to eat with them. I got to hear about the amazing things that God is doing with them. And it is unbelievable. Thursdays, they are part of a program, a, a food ministry called Food for Life. And they basically provide food for 20 families in their community, like fresh food, packaged food, frozen food. That reaches about 51 different people, 20 of which are children. I love this church because they see how they can use their lives to make a difference in the lives of others. For me, that reminds us of what we are about as a church, being for Paris, being for our community, getting in the corners with others. And so Knox, thank you for your warm welcome. I can't wait to hang out with you uh, again. You, you fed me well, the conversation was amazing. And I just left thinking this was a great start to a time away with family. Now, if you're watching this and you're wondering like, what can I do, how can I be used? This is the message of this entire series. Oftentimes we may look at our flaws. We, we may look at the things we, that may prevent us. But understand this, God is faithful. That, that, that when we are willing to be obedient and trust and take a step of faith, God will use you. And so what's a way that you can get involved? Whether it's in your community, whether it's with our church, there's just so many opportunities. Knox Church, you guys are doing amazing things for building God's kingdom. Well, we're delighted that you are with us uh, here this week. Uh, a quick reminder that next Sunday, August 20th, we're having another backyard campfire in our house, at our house, not our house, at our house. Um, there's going to be burgers and hot dogs. Things are being served at uh, 5.30, so come and join us. We'd love for you to be a part of it. And again, we're, we're starting a number of things again this coming fall as we get closer and closer to, to kind of things ramping up again. If you want to hear more and find out more about what we're doing, how you can get connected, sign up for an e-blast, jump on our website, it takes about 20 seconds to do, and then we can continue to connect. I mean, Look at Knox Church. They found us online. They started to connect with us. They started to be intentional about what God wanted them to do. And now they are having a huge, huge impact. Same is true for you. Well, I hope this time together is helpful, is meaningful, and enables you to encounter and connect with God where he wants to speak into your life. Have a great, great rest of your week. Jesus, the only one who could ever see.
We've been spending the past several weeks uh, looking at people in the Bible, uh, some specific stories about people who were both faithful and also flawed at the same time. And I think one of the things that these few weeks have helped me realize is that God loves to use ordinary people to do amazing things, things that, that need to be done, but uh, he loves to use people that are no different than you and me. And I think that that's a reality is that when God wants to accomplish things in this world, he often lays his hand on someone 
and, and he asks them to step up and do what needs to be done. Sometimes if we, if we don't do what he asks, uh, you know, he'll raise somebody else up to, to do the thing that we wouldn't. But there are also times when maybe there isn't somebody else. Maybe we're the only one who is uniquely positioned to do the thing that God is asking us to do. There are a lot of things in this world that I think if, if we don't do them ourselves, they're probably not going to be, be done. And that's the case on an individual level, but also on a corporate level for all of us as a, as a church, as a community, as a society. One, one sad example is that there's enough food in this world to, to feed every person on this planet. But every day over, over 10,000 people die from some disease related to malnourishment because we don't distribute the food that we have properly. That's a, that's a big example, but there are smaller examples too. Like, for example, I know that, that God, one of God's desires for me is to be a good husband, to be a good father, and, and to do things for, for my family that would, that would be good for them. And the reality is that if, if I don't do those things, there's nobody else who is as uniquely positioned as I am to do them. And it's tough. Sometimes that's the way things are, but it's important, and especially in those cases where we know that we're in a unique position to help, it's important that we do the things that, that God wants done, the good things. Which is why today I want to take a look at a man named Nehemiah. Because Nehemiah, I think, shows us exactly how to work with God, to work with him to do the things that he wants done. Now, God's great desire in 446 BC was to restore and revive the community in Jerusalem. The community of Hebrews who were, who were living in Judah, they were desperate at this point in time. Their land was in ruins, the, the wall was broken down and in shambles. People were, were looked down on by their neighbors, neighboring nations. The people were discouraged and they had stopped communing with God in the way that they had in the past. They stopped bringing him their best and putting their best foot forward. Even the priests in Jerusalem were starting to hate doing their jobs as priests. And so it was a tough time. And so to meet the need in that time, what God did was he chose someone. He actually, he chose a few people. He, he rose up a, a Bible scholar named Ezra, uh, a prophet, someone who could speak to those discouraged and, and half-committed people, a man named Malachi. And then he also raised up a, a layman uh, named Nehemiah. And Nehemiah's task was to lead the rebuilding effort, to rebuild the wall. And he would end up serving as, as governor of, of Jerusalem for about 12 years. Now, one of the questions I think we have at the beginning of Nehemiah's story is why did God choose Nehemiah to do this? And there are a number of reasons, and I think one of the first ones is that Nehemiah was prepared. He had risen over the course of his life to a pretty high position, actually, in Persia, the empire that, that ruled over the land of Judah. See, Nehemiah was cupbearer to the king. And being cupbearer doesn't sound very impressive. It, it kind of sounds like maybe he was a dishwasher or someone who, who set the table for the king or things like that. But the reality is that the cupbearer in that days was actually a very important position. He would taste the wine and eat the food before the king did. If anything was poisoned, no more cupbearer, but long live the king. That's essentially was Nehemiah's job. And it actually, in those days, cupbearers, because of that reliance on them, they, they often built a very intimate relationship with the king. Some historians would go so far as to say that there's no one who would really have the ear of the king, other than perhaps his wife, any more than the cupbearer. And so Nehemiah was a man who was in a unique position. And so... He was in this position protecting the king from his enemies by tasting his food. And the reality is that everything that had happened in Nehemiah's life to lead him up to this, 
It was all preparing him for this task that was about to be set before him. In the same way that that everything good and, and bad that has happened to you and me over the course of our lives, it all prepares us for things that we have to do, for things that we need to be ready to do. So Nehemiah was, was prepared, but he was also a man who was concerned. When he heard news of the, the state that, that Judah was in, he was heartbroken. And we can see it that, that he was truly heartbroken. He, he wept and he fasted when he learned the situation that was going on in Judah. Now, not only was he concerned, but he was also a praying man. His concern drove him to his knees in a lot of ways. And the prayers that, that he made in his book, in the book of Nehemiah, they, they fill the entire book. There's, the book begins with a prayer, it ends with a prayer. There are 12 prayers in this book of Nehemiah, which is only 13 chapters long. So he was a praying man as well. Even more than that, Nehemiah was also a, a hard-working man. His concern led him to his knees, and praying on his knees led him to stand up and get to work. He had a job to do. Now, if, if you were to read Nehemiah's diary, just reading it might cause you to want to take a nap, because he prays for, for four months after he hears this news about Judah. And then he goes before the king and he asks permission to travel and to rebuild his people's city, their home. And then, of course, he travels to Jerusalem, which was a journey over 900 miles at the time. He then he inspects the walls, he enlists workers, he, he faces enemies who, who try to thwart his efforts at pretty much every turn. Um, he rebukes a, a bunch of wealthy people living in this city who tried to take advantage of the situation. Um, he stations guards, he has a census taken, he ends up, as I said, becoming governor for 12 years there. And then later, after he leaves Jerusalem and he sees that the work that he had done was starting to be undermined in his absence, he travels all the way back 900 miles again just to clean house and make everything right. Nehemiah put in a lot of work because of the concern that he had for these people. I've been told that the only place where success comes before work is in the dictionary. And I think in Nehemiah's case, that's definitely true. He was a hard worker. And we also see it when he prays. He doesn't pray just to get God's help. He prays to offer his help. As one poet puts it, we might as well kneel down and worship gods of stone as offer to the living God a prayer of words alone. Nehemiah prayed, but he was also a man of action, a hard worker. And he also had to be brave and persistent. And I think the lesson there for us is that the instant that we take a stand for God, we wake up the enemy's forces. There will always be people that try to discourage us from doing work that God wants us to do. People, things... From the day that God told Nehemiah to go and build the wall in Jerusalem, he had one problem and, and one dangerous task after another. It didn't stop. He didn't stop until the wall was finished. He even had to put his life on the line. He did it multiple times. Just asking the king for permission to leave and go home was a risk. And then he was attacked and, and bullied by enemies, and still he kept on building the wall. Which brings me to the, the scripture I want to read this morning, which is in Nehemiah chapter 4. And I think that this passage illustrates for us just how much opposition there was to the work that Nehemiah was trying to do for God. Picking up in verse 1 of Nehemiah chapter 4. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? 
Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah the Ammonite who was at his side said, What they are building, even a fox climbing up on it, would break down their wall of stones. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height. For the people worked with all their heart. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we will kill them and put an end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. From that day on, half of my men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Neither I nor my brothers nor any men nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. This shows us that the task that Nehemiah had undertaken, this task that ultimately was a good task, a task that God wanted to complete it, wanted to be completed. Even so, there were people in the world, there were enemies, people who did not want this to happen. And it was a danger, not only to Nehemiah, but to the entire community, the very people he was trying to help. And I think this, this shows, just goes to show that forever and for always, the church of God has to rise up and do its work in spite of ridicule. And we need to never underestimate at the same time the, the power of discouraging words. Men and women who would face lions for God have gone down in defeat because they were laughed at. So like Nehemiah and his workers who ended up carrying swords with them while they worked, we must always be on guard for things that might keep us from doing the good work that we set out to do. And there are a few other lessons I think that we can learn from Nehemiah and his book. Firstly, we can learn to to always expect opposition. Whenever Nehemiah stepped in faith, he encountered problems. The problems he faced were, were fear, false accusations, treason, threats to his physical well-being, and doubt. Doubt was a part of Nehemiah's life too. You know, I've often heard it said, without an element of doubt, there is no faith. Because faith is trusting that which is not seen. And I think the truth that we can draw from scripture is that acts of great faith will always be accompanied by fear and, and doubt as well. Jesus himself encountered all kinds of difficulty, including death, which I imagine he was afraid of at the time. But if our Lord suffered, then, then we his servants will also suffer far greater than him, probably. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 15 that if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. This is why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. They persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So we know whenever we seek to do the good work of God, we can expect opposition. 
I think we can also learn from Nehemiah that as we go about our work, we need to pray boldly as Nehemiah did. We know that Jesus is our Lord and we can always come to him in prayer. And through him we have access to, to God the Father. No matter what the task is, we need to go to him, seeking what we need to sustain us in the work that we're doing. We do this with his power, or with his spirit. Our strength and abilities sometimes are, are limited, no doubt, but his are not. And so as he, he tells us, as, as Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So we can expect opposition. We need to pray boldly. Also, I think Nehemiah teaches us to focus on the task at hand. How many times have you been distracted from a task? It happens to me pretty much every day. I get distracted from something that I'm trying to do. It's no different with things that we try to do for God. Nehemiah could have stopped at, at any point and gone and personally dealt with these threats that were trying to get him to stop building. But the principle is not to get distracted by those things. Nehemiah didn't get distracted. He continued on. But at the same time, he was also careful to look out for those who were less fortunate than him. He watched out for those who were weak. There will always be a problem with people who, who, who are poor, who are worse off than, than you and I. People who are outcast. And the fact that there will always be those people in our lives doesn't mean that we have a past to ignore it. In our own church, in our own community, our own town, there are people that, that have less than we do. Whether they're poor in spirit and in stature or simply weak physically, we can respond to their needs if we're attentive. That's what Nehemiah did all the while he was rebuilding this wall. He knew that the people in Jerusalem were vulnerable, so he stepped in and aided them according to God's commands. It's as we're instructed in, in Proverbs 31. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and needy. Lastly, I think a huge takeaway from the story of Nehemiah is that with God, all things are possible. It never ceases to amaze me how awesome our God is. And I think the writer of Nehemiah, one of the things that he was trying to do was give us a historical account of one of Israel's greatest events, the, the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem, the restoration. But this book also reminded the people, and it reminds us, that this great work was done with both the provision and the protection of God. They were never to lose sight of the fact that all of this was made possible by God and God alone. With God, anything can be accomplished. The key is for you and I to trust him, to trust him to provide for us when we seek to do his good work. Just like Nehemiah, we face many walls in our lives, in our, in our church, in our community, things that need to be built, things that need to be done to make things better. We face all of those things and on our own, they're probably not possible. That's where a lot of that fear and doubt comes in. But we need to remember, and as Nehemiah's story shows us, with God, everything is possible. We accomplish all of these things by God's power and not our own. 
I'll invite you to, to pray with me. Father, we know that in this world there is lots to be done. We look around and we see desperation, we see war, we see hunger, poverty, we see violence and all manner of things that are, are not right. And God, I pray that you would use each of us. You would use us individually. You would use us as, as a church, as a, a community, a people. You would use us to do your work in changing those things for the better. Help us to make this world a better place in the ways in which you would want us to. And it's not easy, and I think that that's probably why there are so many things that are the way they are. But with your strength, I think Nehemiah's story shows us that it can be done. And God, I just ask that as we come willing to help, willing to put in the work, God, may you put us in positions to do it. May you supply for our needs, supply for the needs of those around us as we are willing to be a part of the solution. And may you guide us in all of that. We ask and we pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. the God who is we worship the God who evermore will be cause he opened the prison doors he parted the raging sea my God he holds the victory there's joy in the house of the Lord there's joy in the house of the Lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out from that grave my God still rolling stones away there's joy in the house of the Lord there's joy in the house of the Lord today and we won't be quiet we shout out your praise there's joy in the house of the Lord our God is surely in this place and we Be quiet, we shout out.